Hey everyone, I'm Sam. I'm a customer engineer and I also work as a GKPM focusing on the deprecation of PSP and also migrating away from PSP uh, to PSA. So um, hopefully this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, but uh, pod security policy has been deprecated since 121 and is gone as of 125, no longer in the Kubernetes code tree. Um, I presume that's why you're all here. So rest in peace, pod security policy. Quick show of hands, uh, how many of you have uh, had a chance to try out pod security admission? All right, great, that's more than I was expecting. So for those who haven't, um, we're not gonna go into too much depth on pod security admission here, but I just wanna give a really quick overview. Um, so pod security admission is an admission controller that's built into Kubernetes and enabled by default uh, on all clusters as of 123, stable in 125. Um, briefly, the way pod security admission works is you choose one of three standards and those are applied on a per namespace level. Uh, the standards are privileged, uh, which means anything goes. This is kind of like not having it there, there at all. Uh, baseline, which allows the, uh, the default pod level fields, um, but doesn't let you escalate permission beyond that. Um, and then restricted adds on some additional requirements like running as non-root uh, to enforce hardening best practices. Um, the standards are published on the Kubernetes website, so um, check that out if you want to know more detail about what all is enforced in there. Um, and all links will be on the last slide as well, so you don't have to try and capture them as we go. Um, so for the uh, talk agenda, um, in a moment I'll hand it over to Sam, who's going to give a uh, demo of kind of the fast path migration um, and what that might look like. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the problems uh, that you can face doing the fast path, um, some of the like challenges in that approach. Um, and then we'll see another demo of how you can do a safer migration, um, going a little slower and taking into account some of those problems. Um, then we'll wrap up with uh, extending um, beyond pod security admission. So when, when you need more control than what's given to you with that. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, hand it over to Sam. Yeah. All right, ready for a demo? In this demo, we're gonna show a quick and easy migration from PSP to PSA, um, ignoring the fact that there's mutating PSPs, which we will, cover, we will cover after the demo. We're gonna cover what a mutating PSP is and why you might have to take special care for that. For now, we're gonna ignore that. We're gonna ignore that. We're gonna assume in this environment there's no mutating PSPs active. So. Um, first, let's verify that this cluster is using PSP, it's active, it's preventing previous pods, which is the main use case for this demo. So we're going to ignore the other rules of this PSP policy. The main thing I want you to look at is previous walls. So this, is, this should prevent us from having any previous pods in this, in, 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 uh, in this namespace. Now, if you want to use PSP, how, how, do you, how do you assign it? You have to create a cluster role where you say, I will be able to use a pod security policy, need my, my PSP, which is the one that we just defined. Then you have to create a cluster role binding or role binding where you assign that role to a specific, uh, for in this case, we're assigning that role to the service accounts in the default namespace. And that's the UX for a PSP. It's, I, I, do you guys love that? Is it, is it very convenient to uh, create a PSP policy, create a cluster role, then assign it for a role binding? It doesn't seem super convenient. And we'll cover that. In, we'll cover that in a moment. Um, so that's how PSP works. Uh, let's let's make sure it's working as expected. We're going to try deploy a previous pod with security context previous true. So what we expect is that this should not work. It should prevent. It should not be able to create a pod. Wait, it did. It did create a deployment successfully, let's take a deeper look at whether it actually really worked or not. Um, we're gonna describe the deployment and see if it actually created pods. Looks like it, it did not create desired replicas. So that's, that's kind of expected, but is it really PSP doing that? We still don't really know. Like, why is it not creating these replicas? We don't really know. Where can we find the error message? Describe pod, describe deployment. It's, it's a bit hard to troubleshoot. Let's take a look at the event logs. Maybe it's there. 
And then in the event logs, we see error creating pods, nginx privs is forbidden because pod security policy is unable to admit the pod. It says previous containers are not allowed, so PSP is doing its job. It was a bit, bit hard to figure out whether it was PSP doing it, but we figured out PSP is working as expected. Um, we're gonna delete this. Uh, it, it, PSP is working as expected. Now we're gonna de deploy a normal Nginx ap application that's not using a privileged uh, security context privileged tool. This is a very standard Nginx deployment. Um, they should also, in this case, we hope that the Replica count will be one, and that's what we'll show in a moment. Um, let's see, yeah, we see that the, this, this time the application deployed successfully because it's another privileged pod. So great, everything works as expected, but now what we wanna do, we're using PSP. There's an application running in production in the default namespace. Now we wanna be able to migrate from PSP to PSA. Um, the easy strategy is to just try the different pod security standards in enforce mode, in dry run mode. So that's what we're gonna try and do. We're gonna start with the most secure, and then we're gonna see if, we're gonna see if the dry run mode throws any warnings to see if the currently running pods could be admitted by the restricted pod security standard. So that's what we're doing here. Starting with restricted, then we see existing pods in namespace default violate the new security uh, level, Restricted, so that means that the currently running pods could not be enforced by restricted. Restricted is too restrictive for our applications running in the default namespace. So next, we had three, we had three standards, restricted, baseline, and privileged. So next we're gonna try baseline, which might be a better fit for our currently running application. We'll do the same thing, we run it in dry run mode to see if it throws any warnings. And this time there's no warning thrown, which means that the currently running pods could be admitted um, if I were to enforce the baseline pod security standard. So next we're run, gonna run almost the same command, but the only thing that's different is we're not gonna add dry run. And if we do this, we have started enforcing the pod security standard baseline. That's all we need, we just add a label. Before we had to create a PSP policy, cluster role, role binding, all we need to do right now is we add a label. That's all we need for PSA. So that's a, I think that's an improvement in UX. I think it feels more easy than having to, to create all these different resources. Um, so next, we enabled PSA, but PSP is still active in this namespace. Um, actually, one more thing I wanted to add. We're also gonna add, there's different control modes for PSA. We set it in enforce mode. At the same time, we can also tell PSA to turn on warn mode. And at the moment, I will show you what warm, warm mode does. Um, but for now, there's one more thing we gotta do. We have PSP still active in this namespace. We also have PSA active. We should de disable PSP in this namespace as well. And then our expectation is that the privileged pods should still be prevented from being admitted because the baseline profile does not allow privileged pods. So Tim came actually up with a pretty clever way is a way to disable PSP on a per namespace level. Because in most cases, PSP is enabled at a cluster, but how can, you, how can you only disable it for a single namespace? Tim came up with a way you define a previous PSP that basically has no restrictions whatsoever. By defining this previous PSP and then assigning it only in the namespace to the service that comes in the namespace, we can effectively disable PSP only for a single namespace. And this is also great because it also allows us to roll back. Let's say for some reason my PSP policy is still required, I need to quickly roll back this migration. You can remove this previous PSP from this namespace and then you're back to uh, your original PSP that was ac active in this namespace. So next, <laughs> the same flow as with PSP, you have to create a cluster role to be able to use this new previous PSP and then we create a role binding where we assign this previous PSP to all the service accounts in the default namespace. And after we do this, PSP should no longer be active. Let's verify it. Is it really no longer active? So we're gonna verify that by deploying the same Nginx privilege uh, pod deployment. As you can see, this one has the previous true again, and I'm gonna apply that. And this time, you see directly a warning. 
You remember in the previous example where I did it with PSP, there was no warning thrown. It just said deployment created, but I had no clue that something was blocking my pods from being created. With PSA, however, if you, if you edit that warn mode uh, in, in addition to enforce mode, you will get a warning thrown even when you create a deployment, not just when you create a pod directly, which is very helpful for user experience. Users are otherwise they're like, oh, my deployment is working. Try with my web application. <laughs> What happened? You just don't know. You've got to start looking at events logs. It's not a great user experience. So this time the, the warning is directly thrown. And if we go to the, uh, if you look at the warning, you see that it must, it would violate pod security baseline. So this is not, this is not a PSP error. And if we look at the event log, where we previously saw that PSP error message, this time we should be able to see a different error message from, from pod security instead of pod security policy. So let's take a look. Yeah, here it says violates pod security baseline. And in our previous error message with, with PSP, it said pod security policy. <laughs> it's, it's a subtitle, it's a small change, but based on the error message, we know that PSA is active and PSP is no longer active in this namespace. So this was the, the fast and, <laughs> I know, it didn't seem super fast, but this is the fast and easy migration where we ignore the fact of mutating PSPs and Tim will cover more about what are, the, what are some of the gotchas of this approach and why this might not be the right approach for everyone. So uh, back to you, Tim, to let me put it in present mode. Yeah. All right, thanks for that demo. Um, so yeah, the, um, there's a couple problems with this approach. Uh, so the first is what happens if you don't have any pods that are representative of a workload that needs to run? Um, so this could be the case if you have um, maybe a controller that runs pods on demand, uh, something like a cron job that only runs periodically, um, or maybe for, uh, you have some workload that's scaled down to zero, um, or just something that hasn't launched yet. Um, so in this case, uh, pod security admission gives you two tools, um, warn mode and audit mode. Um, we already saw a demo of how warn mode works, um, giving a warning and feedback back to the user directly. Audit mode is uh, basically the same thing, but it's going to add an annotation into the audit logs. Um, so this can be useful if you want to enable audit mode across all your namespaces, let it soak for a while, like a week or, or however much time you have, um, and then you can go back through your audit logs and see if there were workloads during that time that ran that would have violated the policy, that would have been blocked by, um, uh, by the enforce mode. Um, so the second problem, uh, which uh, Sam already alluded to, is mutations. So pod security policy um, can mutate pods. Um, it uh, has a bunch of different ways of defaulting various fields. So if something isn't set on the pod directly, uh, pod security policy will set it for you. Uh, this could be a problem because what happens if one of those fields is actually critical to the way the application is running? Uh, then suddenly disabling pod security policy could lead to a production outage. So a quick quiz. Here's a bunch of uh, fields from the pod security policy spec. Which of these are mutating? All right, so if you said all of them, you would be correct. Um, not in all conditions, but at each one of these fields can mutate the pod. Um, and I recommend checking out this resource on the uh, Kubernetes documentation page. This has a full list of all of the fields in pod security policy, which are mutating, which are just validating. Um, and it also has a mapping of how those uh, translate into um, pod security admission. Um, so with that, uh, back to Sam. Yeah, so Tim just explained that our previous approach might not work if you have mutating PSPs. And I will show you why exactly it might not work um, the way you think it would work. So let's let's get started with this one. This is this is actually this is actually fun. No, this is actually a real application that we're going to show, <laughs> and um, fun thing will happen with it. So same pod security policies in the previous demo, but this time I want you to pay attention to these rules. Now we just paid attention to Tim's quiz. Which of these are mutating? All right, raise your hands if you think it's all of them. <laughs> raise your hands if you think it's only, it's SE Linux. Is SE Linux mutating? 
is supplemental groups mutating. All right, I see a few hands. Is run as user mutating in this case? Uh, you guys, you guys, you know your stuff. Huh. That's great, that's great. If, is FS group mutating? Great. I, uh, <laughs> some people didn't raise any hands, but I don't know why that's because you think none of them are mutating or just you didn't want to raise your hand, which is, which is a good reason too. Um, so in this case, actually, SE Linux and supplemental groups are not mutating because it says run as any. So it's not as simple, the, f the field is mutating or not. It depends on whether the rule under it um, has run as any or must run as. The must run as are, well, can be mutating. Actually, they don't have to be mutating either, but can be mutating. These will never be mutating because it's run as any. This is why it's not that simple, <laughs> as you can see. Is my PSP muting my pods? It's actually not a simple question to answer. Um, so let's get, let's get further with this. So we have the same deployment. It's an Nginx app. It serves a very simple index HTML. We're going to deploy this. Um, PSP is, is active. I'm, I'm just ignoring that, but we did the same thing. We have the PSP policy, cluster or world binding is all still active. Um, we have a simple config map that shows welcome to KubeCon 2022 that's being served by this application. And I want you to take special attention to only the, own, only the owner can read and write this index HTML. Um, and let's take a look at the, so we had a deployment spec that had a pod spec what it should be running, right? We'll, we'll compare the two in a moment. What I'm gonna show you right now is I'm gonna show you the pod spec of the currently running pod. And there are, there are many more stuff in there that get automatically populated, but I want you to take a look at stuff that, it didn't, that I didn't expect to be in there. Suddenly my pod has a security context run as user of 2005. It has the container spec in the pod spec has that. And in the, the pod spec has a security context for, for FS group 1005. Now where, where is this coming from? Who did this? Who added this to my pod? That's the mutating PSP piece. So we see here the um, PSP policy we had is run as user min 2005. So what PSP does, it takes the first value, if you didn't set it yourself, from this PSP, from the min value, and it adds it to the pod as a security, add, to the security context of the container spec. And then for FS group, it does the same thing, but it adds, adds it to the security context of the pod spec. So this is mutating PSP. It's just adding fields that, I mean, you look at this PSP policy, did you expect that to happen? I, <laughs> some people might if you have done this before, but if you have never done this, I didn't expect this to happen the first time I used PSP. Um, so that's, that's mutating PSP. Now let's take a look at the application that's working fine right now with our PSP policy. Um, let me get out of here. Um, yes, my port for, it's working. The application is running. Um, I did a simple port forward to the service as basically exposing this Nginx application. I'm, I'm leaving that out. Um, so the application is running fine. Now let's migrate to to pod security admission and then force the baseline um, pod security standard, just like we did before. We already know that we need to, to do baseline, so I'm not gonna do the whole dry runs. Um, we're gonna do the same flow where we're gonna disable PSP by applying the previous PSP. And um, yeah, we, we create a cluster role for the previous PSP. Then we create a role binding to assign the previous PSP to the service accounts in the default namespace. And then after we do that, we're like, well, we got a new version of our application. Let's deploy that and see, should, should be, should, should, should still work fine, right? It's just, we didn't change more. We just moved to PS, from PSP to PSA. Should be a small change. Let's see, it restarted. And what it means, it recreates the pod. So the pod got recreated. We're gonna do the same port forward to check how our, how our application is doing. And it should, should be fine. But no, I get a 403 forbidden. That, that, might, that might cause downtime for my users if that, if that happened, right? Like suddenly, suddenly my application is not behaving the way I expect it to. It's like, well, what happened, right? We, did just, we just did a move from PSP to PSA. What, what, why, why is this happening to my application? Um, let's take a look at the currently running pod spec after we recreated the pod 
and, and migrated from P PSP to PSA. So we look at the, at the, the pod spec now. Before there was this security context run as user under the container spec, it's gone now. And the security context under the pod spec is no longer being set. And the reason is because we had a mutating PSP that was doing this for us. But we moved off of PSP and that was no longer happening. And the, the way I coded specifically the Nginx app is that only that user, that, that 2005 user ID has access to access it file. So now we're getting a 403 forbidden because the Nginx users running no longer can read the Nginx HTML. So this is a somewhat realistic scenario. There are other scenarios that you might encounter where, where the mutating PSP was adding fields that your, your application expected. So how do we fix it? We gotta quickly fix this. So instead of relying on PSP to add these fields, we can add them directly to our deployment spec. So instead of relying them to be added, we simply add these fields directly to the deployment spec itself. To, this, this one is at the pod spec level, and this one is at the container uh, spec level. And then we apply, and hopefully that will get our application back up and running. Um, let's see. It worked, yes, we're, 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 we're back online. Um, so I think this demo, the, the, main, the main goal of showing this demo is that mutating PSP is something you'd have to take special care of. Like in some cases, the mutating PSP, you might your application might depend on this. So you, ha you have to account for it. And <laughs> I sh I sh we showed in the beginning, right? Like how do, we, how do you figure out whether my PSP is mutating my pods? Are you gonna go one by one, look at all your individual pod specs and look at my deployment spec and see, is there a difference in the security context? That seems, that seems uh, I don't know. I don't know if anyone, any human should not be responsible for doing this, is my view. So um, we did write a tool for that, uh, PSP Migrator, that makes it a lot easier to detect whether your pods are being mutated by PSP. It basically does the thing for you. It will check your, it will check the owner reference of a pod it will then check the owner reference uh, pod spec with the actual running pod and see if there's a difference in the security context. If there is, then it's highly likely it's being mutated by PSP. So as the approach we took with uh, PSP Migrator, it's the same deployment we're using for this. It's, uh, I'm quickly gonna demonstrate how PSP Migrator makes it a lot easier to detect PSP and migrate off from PSP to PSA. So we have the same deployment, same HTML uh, web application that's serving. And I just want to quickly demonstrate that we have um, two, it's still being mutated. You see, this is back. So I, I reverted everything back. This, this is a clean mutating, PSP is mutating in this deployment, this pod again. Um, but this time we're gonna use PSP migrator to detect the mutation and migrate from PSP to PSA. So we're gonna install it. It's a very simple COI to, um, I would say it's still a work in progress, but it's ready for people to try. Um, so I encourage people to try it out early, get some feedback, and then we can keep on improving the tool. Um, we're gonna run a quick, quick list of all the pods that are mutating, and it, it correctly detects that, my, that this pod is mutated, and is mutated by my, my PSP. Uh, there's another comment where you can run mutating PSP my PSP, and then it will list which fields are mutating and which annotations are mutating. And it correctly detected run as user and FS group are potentially mutating fields in your PSP object. Let me take a drink. Talking too much. <laughs> so the next thing we have, we have an interactive migrate comment of PSP migrate that will go over all your namespaces and then suggest what's the most secure pod security standard that is able to admit all the running pods in your current namespace. In addition, it has a safeguard where it first checks if your pods are being mutated. If they're being mutated, it will tell you first, please first fix your pod spec so PSP is no longer mutating. So let's take a look at the output of the comment. We see that it's gonna check if there are any pods being mutated. And then it sa says the table below shows the pods that are mutated by a PSP object. And then run this command to, give, to get more details of 
how your pod is mutated and by what. So let's run that. And then we can see that in the output, it will tell you that the security context is different. The, the output is still something that, that I'm working on. It wasn't, it wasn't super straightforward to, to code up, but it also tells us the FS group is different than uh, in 64. Yeah, this is, this is straight from Golang, the output. Um, and it also tells the, the mutating fields. So I, now, I know that I have to fix my deployment. I'm gonna quickly fix that the same way we did it before. Um, we add those two fields to the deployment uh, pod spec. And then afterwards, I run the migrate command again. And my expectation is that this time it should, it, it's gonna check for P mutating PSP, but this time it will allow us to continue with the actual migration. Um, so this time it checked if any pods are being mutated and it didn't find any, and then it suggests using the baseline, the same thing that we found out by doing a manual process is it suggests using baseline in namespace default. And if you press enforce, it will automatically apply the label for you on the namespace. And we can verify that quickly by running a uh, get namespace default and get the YAML. And that's how the, pod, the PSP migrator allows you to have an easier migration process than having to do all of this by yourself. It also, you can also use it kind of as a library. There are, there are a few calls that you can import so you can script around, um, like, is my pod mutating? It's actually not purely a CLI to it. You can also use it as a library. Yeah. Cool. I think those were the, yeah, those were the demos. Um, I mean, next to you, Tim. You wanna go back to, to the slides? The slides, yeah. All right, so, uh, so far we've been talking about migrating from pod security policy to pod security admission. Um, when we designed pod security admission, our goal was really to have super simple out of the box security uh, for Kubernetes. Um, and so we made some uh, design compromises to make, to really chase that simplicity and ease of use. Um, but there are some cases, uh, it wasn't designed to cover every possible use case. So some limitations of pod security admission. Um, the first is that it's using namespace labels to control it. Um, this makes it easy to apply. It makes it easy to search across your cluster which namespaces are using which profiles. But it also means that if users have edit access on the namespaces, they can modify those labels and escalate permissions. Um, it also means that if you're creating new namespaces, you need to make sure that those get labeled as well. Um, probably the biggest limitation is the lack of customization. We'll take questions at the end. Um, uh, the lack of customization. So uh, you have to choose one of these three profiles, um, privileged, uh, baseline, or restricted. Um, if you want to customize those, uh, you'll need to use one of the alternatives that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, we already covered the lack of mutation. Um, that's just not something that pod security admission takes care of. Um, and then finally, uh, we strongly advise against trying to subdivide policy within a namespace. But if that's something that you really need to do, uh, then you'll need some tool other than pod security admission. So in the cases when uh, pod security admission isn't uh, enough for your use case, um, there's a whole ecosystem of third-party admission controllers um, the two that I call out here are Open Policy Agent, which is um, a really powerful uh, policy engine that lets you write uh, policies in Rego, which is a kind of policy DSL. Uh, you can also use Gatekeeper, which is a framework built on top of OPA uh, that adds some kind of Kubernetes native features. It lets you uh, template policies and apply those uh, through CRDs. Um, Caverno is another policy engine uh, that's designed um, to be uh, for Kubernetes. Um, it's a little less powerful than, and flexible than OPA, but uh, it also can be simpler to understand the policies and to write the policies um, because of that trade-off. Um, I'm personally really excited about cell admission. So cell is another policy DSL. And we're actually going to be building this into the API server, starting with Kubernetes 126. 
Um, and so you'll be able to apply arbitrary policy through cell policies without having to run a separate webhook. Um, unfortunately, the talk that's referenced here already happened earlier today, so if you didn't have a chance to catch that, I definitely recommend checking out the recording when that's out. You can also read the KEP directly. That'll be hopefully going to alpha in 126. Uh, and finally, uh, if you, especially if you're already familiar with the Kubernetes client libraries, um, it might be easier than you think to just write your own uh, admission controller. Um, if you're using client go, uh, I recommend using cube builder, which can automate a lot of the boilerplate associated with that. Um, or you can also check out the pod security admission uh, implementation. It actually ships with a webhook. Now, if you're using one of these alternative solutions, uh, that doesn't mean you can't use pod security admission. Um, it was actually designed to work really well with another solution at the same time. So it's super lightweight. Um, doing it this way gets you some defense in depth in case your webhook ever goes down or is accidentally deleted. Um, it can also minimize your custom functions. So if you're relying on, say, the baseline policy and just adding a few additional constraints on top of that, you don't necessarily need to re-implement the whole baseline pod security standard in your custom policy engine. You just need those additional constraints on top of it. Um, and then finally, because pod security standards and pod security admission is developed by the Kubernetes community and built in, uh, there's sort of a guarantee that any new features that get added to Kubernetes are going to be constrained by pod security admission. Uh, a recent example of this was ephemeral containers. Um, if you had policies that were checking fields on containers, you might have been checking the containers field and the init containers field, but when ephemeral containers launched, now suddenly there's a third type of container that needs to have its policy checked. Um, and yeah, so our recommendation is to apply the most secure pod security standard you can with pod security admission, uh, and then apply additional constraints on top of that. Uh, so in conclusion, um, we recommend that you start early, uh, take it slow, um, try and unblock your 125 upgrade before uh, you really uh, need to get up to 125. Um, we definitely recommend an Im incremental approach. Um, so Sam demoed uh, how you can use a privileged pod security policy bound to an individual namespace to migrate one namespace at a time. You don't need to do the whole cluster at once. Um, and remember to be aware of mutations and um, scaled to zero workloads. So with that, thank you. Um, here's all the links that were referenced uh, in the talk and a few other resources. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, if there's time. If I understood what I saw, there was a, a clever warning that you admitted when you tried to create, I think it was a deployment, and it caught on to the fact that the pod spec template would mm -hmm. later cause problems. Did you have any ideas for how um, custom, custom resources that say also could create pods could tie into that kind of mechanism? Yeah, so we talked about this when we were, um, in case anyone didn't hear the question, uh, the question is, um, if you have a custom resource that's controlling pod deployments, um, how can you have a similar warning or audit mechanism on that? Um, we talked about building something into pod security for this. Um, we didn't uh, ultimately decide to go that way. Um, but, the, but pod security admission is designed um, as a library. So if you take a look at the code there, um, presumably if you have a CRD that's doing this, you also have a custom controller that's uh, monitoring those. Um, and so it should be pretty easy to extend that code if you want to um, add a custom type in um, like a webhook that's working on that. We probably have time for one question. Okay. Hi, uh, are there plans to uh, build in custom uh, security levels into pod security admission, or is that just find another solution? Um, there are no plans for that. Uh, I, well, let me rephrase that. Uh, cell admission, I think, is really our, our plan for that. Um, that lets you, that will let you build custom security policies, um, but also a lot more. Anything that you would do with admission uh, control today, aside from like maybe some stateful things, but 
we really think that will cover uh, most of, if not all, of the use cases beyond um, that. Okay, thanks. All right, that is the time we have. Thank you for attending, and please find the speakers after the session for more questions.